briefly talk about turbulent combustion concepts. And um, uh, one question that was asked me asked of me just a minute ago was, um, let's just be careful what we mean by non-premixed and premixed. So when I say a premixed flame, I mean the fuel is coming to the right and the air is coming to the right. They're both mixed together and the products are going out to the right. Uh, Non-premixed, the fuel is coming to the right, but the air is coming in from the left, and the products are going away from the flame in both directions, both into the fuel and into the air. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, fuel and products, and on the right-hand side, you have air and products. And now if you, uh, if you draw a, a jet flame, the argument is that um, with fast chemistry, the fuel and products on the inside, air and products on the outside, and the fuel and the oxygen cannot coexist except along this infinitely thin line, which we call the flame or the flamelet. And um, products diffuse away from that flamelet in both directions, and so we we get this these mixtures. And so. Um, this is a, uh, a powerful concept. And now if we imagine this to be oscillating in space, so here's different times you get this wrinkly looking flame. Then at a given point, and here's a little square that I drew here, like right at that particular time, um, there's no um, blue line in that square, and so there's no flame in that square. But at other times, uh, uh, the flame will be in that square. So, in the interrogation box, sometimes you see the flame and there's a chemical reaction going on, but most of the time there's no chemistry going on or, or very little chemistry because it's either uh, fuel and products or air and products. So um, if you ask how much chemistry is going on in that little box, um, you say, well, first tell me how often is that flame in the box? And then once the flame is in the box, then what's happening in that flame? And so what Norbert Peters, um, Professor Williams, Professor Law, uh, Professor Kendall, some of the people here, they worked on this and they're all credited with this flamelet idea. Um, and that is that, let's just say this is, that, that this, this, uh, this uh, blue line that I've drawn has some similarities to a counterflow laminar, in this case, non-premixed flame. Because once the blue line is in the box, then I know what's happening. It's, a, uh, it's whatever Chemkin tells me is happening in a counterflow flame. But I need to know the probability that the flame is in the box first. So this state relation here is generated by Chemkin for a counterflow, in this case, uh, let's start with an unstrained non premix flame, and then you can, you can that would be a very low strain rate. Um, and then you can run Chemkin for a strained flame. And so many of you may have run Chemkin where you have fuel and air coming at each other in a counterflow situation. You can generate this map. So um, following on what I said last time, if you know Z, you know the mass fraction of O2. So we were always on the uh, lean side, so that would be right between pure air and stoichiometric. So we were talking about a lean mixture. And so if I knew what Z was, let's say Z is this number right here, I could, I could go up and I could go to this black line here and find out Y02. And that was actually, um, uh, if I can do this, that was this curve right here. Now this is a straight line, okay, and it has a negative slope. So um, um, that would be this dotted line right here. For fast chemistry, if I knew what Z was, I could just look up the mass fraction of O2. Notice on the left side of this uh, stoichiometric case, we only have O2 and we have uh, products. And I didn't plot the products. I got temperature, but I got O2. On the right side of this Stoichiometric, I have fuel, and I will have some products, okay? So these conditions correspond, 
this fuel lean condition would correspond to little boxes that are outside the flame, the jet flame, and uh, all these conditions on the right of this stoichiometric would correspond to inside the jet flame. But the whole idea here is that if I had some way to solve an equation for z, I could then determine all these other quantities by just going to this table. And the argument is that if it's a strained flame, you would change from the dotted line to some other solid line, which you can get from Chemkin. Okay, so this is the fundamental equation that is used in turbulent combustion models. It says that the mean uh, mass fraction of some species, in this case, let's say carbon monoxide, is equal to the state relation for carbon monoxide as a function of Z, which is given by a laminar flamelet, times the probability that that laminar flamelet is um, in your interrogation box, or the probability that you have Z in that range that you're interested in. So, for example, um, um, what is the mass fraction of, uh, of CO as a function of Z? Well, it might look like this, okay? Um, I'm sorry, uh, the probability of Z would look something like this, okay? Um, and that's a, a PDF. And so if we took this function and we multiplied it by this function, we could get this, this quantity. Now, uh, YCO would be a, uh, something on the state relation, which I didn't, but um, that was on the previous slide. Uh, uh, I didn't plot YCO, but if we did that, uh, um, there wouldn't be much CO on this side, and there would be, um, uh, it'd be a lot of CO over here, and uh, so we'd have some sort of a curve that was, would be over here. That would be YCO as a function of Z. We get this from Chemkin. We just assume a laminar strain flame, and we can put that in here. And then we need the probability that the, 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 the Z is in the range um, that we're interested in, and we multiply these two and we get the mean. Now, um, the PDF, it, let's say it's a Gaussian, you know, it may not be a Gaussian, but we know that a, any kind of a, a probability function like this, a histogram, depends on its mean and its variance. So z bar would be this number right here. It would be the mean of this function. And the variance uh, would be uh, related to the width, the half width of this Gaussian. So if I knew what z bar and z prime squared are, I could then, uh, and if I knew the general shape of this it being a Gaussian, then I could uh, plot this, this function. But I need an equation for z bar, and I need an equation for the variance. And I get this from the Chemkin laminar flamelet lookup tables, assuming that we have flamelets present. So we've reduced the problem from having to solve a lot of partial differential equations for each species to um, an equation for z bar, equation for z prime squared, and then um, an assumed shape for the PDF, and then a flamelet lookup tables, which I get from Chemkin. So the problem becomes much simpler. Now, what, uh, how can you just assume a PDF shape? Well, you have to do uh, a lot of analysis and experiments and see what PDF shape works best. And um, a beta function is this function. And these are all the possible solutions. Um, now, uh, for example, this PDF right here says there's a whole lot of probability of pure fuel, and there's a lot of probability of pure air, but not so much probability of, of uh, things in between. Okay, that corresponds to one alpha and one beta in this function. This PDF would say, uh, there's no pure fuel, and there's no pure air, but there's a lot of intermediates. Uh, this one here would say no pure air, uh, but a lot of whatever this is, this would be low Z, which would be uh, lean things. 
And this PDF would have a whole lot of pure fuel and no pure air. So this function has a lot of possibilities. Um, it has only two parameters, alpha and beta. And you can then show that alpha is related to the, uh, alpha and beta are both related to the mean and variance of z. So once again, we, we, can, um, we can get mean properties. Um, OK. So uh, to repeat, we could solve the differential equations, but we need source terms. Instead, we use this uh, approach where we um, solve the differential equation for something, in this case, the non-dimensional temperature called reactiveness. In non-premixed flames, we solve this quantity called Z, which is the, the uh, non-dimensional hydrogen atom mass fraction. And then we plug it into an equation like this, and we get the mean quantities at each point. OK. Um, so why do we do all this? Um, why don't we just do a simpler, something much simpler? Um, suppose you have this equation for the uh, carbon monoxide mass fraction. Why don't we make the assumption that the mean reaction rate is equal to, uh, it's, it's proportional to the mean fuel concentration or, or mass fraction, the, the mean oxygen mass fraction times some uh, Arrhenius factor, possibly with a, a, a pre-exponential here, and a mean temperature. So we're saying that uh, uh, the reaction rate just depends on the mean properties at that point. We put them into the Arrhenius equation, we get a mean reaction rate. And I'm trying to argue here, this is totally wrong. Um, suppose I am at a point P here. And suppose I have uh, hot products here and cold reactants, and there's a premix flame, and it's bouncing back and forth. So um, if the um, reactants are present only, um, they're cold, because uh, reactants are cold, and so there cannot be a chemical reaction going on. If there are only products present, well, they're hot, but there, there are no uh, reactants, so um, there cannot be a reaction. The only time that there's a chemical reaction going on is, is when, this, is when this, uh, this thin line here is on top of P. The rest of the time, there's no chemical reaction. So if you took the time average temperature at the point P. So you're sitting here, oops, you're sitting here and you know this thing is going back and forth. Let's say half the time it's cold, half the time it's hot. We, we um, sorry about that. Um, we take the time average of 24, uh, let's say, um, you know, the, the, the time average temperature could be something like 1,200 Kelvin. It, um, you know, ha if half the time it's hot, half the time it's cold, you get some, some other temperature here. The mean temperature would be totally meaningless. Because, it, and the same way with the mean oxygen and the mean um, react, uh, fuel concentration, because a lot of the time the fuel will be present, a lot of time the oxygen will be present. But the... Um, the main thing is you need to know when do you simultaneously have fuel, oxygen, and temperature. So it's, a, uh, it's pretty obvious that you cannot have a reaction unless all three are present at the same time. So that's where the PDF comes in. It, it, uh, it helps you to determine the probability that all three are present at the same time. Now. Um, um, there is another way to do this, and that is to uh, um, say that the probability that the flame is given by the flame surface density. So we say, um, what is the um, um, reaction rate per unit surface? And then we multiply that by the surface density. So this is another way that people do modeling. So we, um, we define... Um, sigma to be the flame surface area per unit volume. And we define rho r s sub l 
That is the, um, um, that's going to have a, the dimensions of uh, kilograms per second uh, per, per unit area. So that's how much um, reactant is consumed uh, by the little flamelet as it, as it moves in space. And this is the area per unit volume of all the flamelets. So the argument here is, uh, let's suppose you have a little flamelet here. And the volume of second of reactants overtaken by the wave, if this is a premix flame, um, is, is equal to the area times the distance moved per second. So we have a certain surface area of, the, of this black line. And um, the volume that this sweeps out will be the volume in between here. And so it's area times distance. That gives you volume and then per second. So that's volume per second that, that uh, is, is basically what I'm showing here in a small time. Okay. Now, if it's a laminar flamelet, the, the distance it moves normal to itself is the laminar burning velocity. So uh, the mass per second consumed would just be the density of the reactants that are in this thing, in this sl sliver, multiplied by the volume per second. So um, the mass per second of reactants that are overtaken as the flame moves from here to here is, is this number, the density times the flames, laminar flame speed times the area of this wrinkled surface, AT. OK. And so the argument is then that the mass per second per unit volume consumed is equal to the mass per second of reactants overtaken which is rho S sub L A T. But now we say A T, we divide it by volume, and we get something called the flame surface density, which is the area per unit volume. So you imagine a, uh, um, if you take a piece of paper and you just hold it out like this, it has a certain area, and it doesn't fill up very much volume. But you know, then you wrinkle it up into like a fractal, which where it, now you have, um, a totally different surface area per unit volume. And uh, the more you uh, compress that, the more surface area you have in, in the volume. And so that sigma is a, is a measure of that. And sigma is related to the PDF, because if the flame is really dense, you know, like here's, here's I mean, if you have flames that are really wrinkled and dense, then it'll have a high probability of, of being there. So that's another concept that's in the models, the flame surface density models. So let's define the flame surface density to be the limit of the flame area per unit volume if you take a small little uh, volume. And you, mathematically, if you make the limit go to zero, um, it's, it's, it's more accurate. Uh, now, as L delta x goes to zero, this goes to zero, and this goes to zero, and the two of them go to zero such that sigma um, doesn't go to zero. In fact, you can see si sigma has the dimensions of one over millimeters because it's area over volume. Now, we can't measure the area of the flame surface. That would take a three-dimensional measurement. What we can do is we can take a laser sheet and we can measure the perimeter of the flame surface. So you imagine a slice of a three-dimensional flame and you get a, 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 a wrinkled line that's the perimeter of the wrinkled flame surface. And then delta x would be a, delta x squared would be the area of a, of a really small interrogation box in the two-dimensional image taken with a laser sheet. Okay, so here's, here's my image. I get this picture of this wrinkly looking flame. I make a little box here and I compute sigma for this box. And Sigma tells me the probability the flame is there. It's the surface area per unit volume. And so if I put this little box over here, I don't get very much sigma. If I put it in the middle of the brush, I get a lot of sigma. And if I put it out here, I don't get much at all. So, so sigma is a, um, is a useful quantity. OK. Now, um, 
Suppose the flame is not wrinkled, but it oscillates right to left and back and forth. Um, uh, uh, here's my little uh, red box, and the flame is moving from this to this, and it's jumping back and forth. And so the idea here is that uh, if here's my box, somehow the flame goes this way and this way, and it goes over the, the box. Okay. Now, what is the flame perimeter, the average flame perimeter, divided by delta x squared? Well, the average flame perimeter is the instantaneous flame perimeter when the flame is in the box, okay? The, the perimeter of the flame in the box is uh, is, um, well, uh, 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 um, when the flame is in the box, um, the, the uh, flame perimeter is approximately delta x. So let's imagine this black line being on top of this red box. What's the perimeter of the flame in the box? It's approximately delta x, okay? It's just a line inside of the box. But the average flame perimeter is um, the perimeter when it's in the box times the average amount of time that it's in the box. So the fraction of the time that it's inside the box, if it's bouncing back and forth, is gonna be equal to uh, delta x divided by this entire brush thickness, delta t. So, if this box is one-tenth of the distance here, then about a tenth of the time will the flame be in the box. So the argument is you should multiply the two together, A and B, that's what I, the A and B, this means A and this is B. So uh, we get delta X squared on the top, and so the average uh, perimeter is delta X squared divided by the flame brush thickness, delta T, but the flame surface density is this number divided by delta x squared. So the delta x squared cancels out. And so, as we would hope, the flame surface density is a constant, and a number, even though the perimeter is going to zero and the delta x squared is going to zero. OK, so the delta x squareds cancel out. And so, we, you know, when I tell my students to, to measure flame surface density, we always try different interrogation box sizes. And if you're doing it right, the size of the delta x should not affect the measurement because it's canceled out. So that sort of tells you the probability that the flame is, is there. So here's a, an image of one of our flames. In this case, uh, we use uh, me scattering, so we put oil drops in this flame and illuminate them with a laser, and you can see the boundary of the flame real nicely, and you make a little red box to determine the edge. And you take thousands of these images, and you determine the average perimeter when it's in the box, which again is uh, about delta x, and then you determine the probability that it's in the box, and you put them together, and you get the flame surface density. OK. Um, so um, what we're trying to do is, is combine flamelet ideas, laminar flamelet ideas, and probability that a flamelet is present. And when you multiply those two together, either by taking that integral that I described or by doing flame surface density, they're pretty much equivalent, um, you then get the reaction rate of the turbulent flame. Problem, though, is you have to um, somehow model um, the, the PDF. You need the mean and its variance with some equations, or you need a, um, a model for the flame surface density, which means an equation for flame surface density. OK, so we'll get into that in a minute, but um, uh, Dom Kohler said a couple of things many years ago, is that um, if you just have a small amount of turbulence, you can imagine a flame, a turbulent flame, to be a laminar flame with a larger surface area. And each segment of this wrinkled flame is acting like a laminar flame. It's propagating against the reactants, consuming reactants. And the more area, the more consumption. So 
you will get a, uh, a larger propagation speed S sub t if this is, has more area. Um, this was the argument I just had on the previous slide. And so the, uh, uh, the mass per second of reactants overtaken by the wrinkle line is, the, is uh, proportional to the area of the wrinkled line. The more wrinkled, in theory, the more um, reactants get overtaken. So um, if you then um, divide this by, if you take the, the dotted line and you say that, um, we call this the A sub L, which would be an equivalent, uh, it doesn't really mean laminar, but it means just a, a line going through the wrinkled line that's, that's straight, so this line is straight. And so um, this is the center of the overall wave. So if we say this dotted line is like a wave and it moves ahead at S sub T, um, how much reactance does this dotted line over, overtake? Well, it's moving at S sub T and it has an area A sub L. And so it would be, a, um, it would be this number, it'd be the density of the reactance times S sub T, which is a big number, and A sub L, which is a small number. So you see, this is, this is, this is different. These two are different. Um, this one is the small burning velocity and the large area, and this is the large burning velocity and the small area, and we're saying that the two are the same. So um, the, the dotted line is overtaking the same, you know, after a long time, the, the, as it propagates, the dotted line is overtaking and consuming the same amount as the, the wrinkled line. So this just says that the turbulent burning velocity divided by a laminar burning velocity is equal to AT over AL, which is uh, the area of the wrinkled line divided by the area of the straight line. Tom Kohler came up with this, and um, you can then relate this to the flame surface density because this is an area per unit volume, and if we integrate area per unit volume, integrate it over a volume, now d eta would be the direction normal to the flame, uh, xi would be tangential, tangential to the flame, and let's say w is in this direction, this would be a volume, and the point is you take volume, you multiply it by area per unit volume, and you get area. So, this flame surface density is a measure of the wrinkled area. And so um, uh, uh, Bray and the Cambridge group came up with this idea a long time ago that if you took this area ratio, um, this area ratio between a turbulent and wrinkled flame is just equal to the integral of the flame surface density. So this is another way of, 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 of uh, determining how fast the turbulent flame should propagate. It should go faster if it has more surface area per unit volume. But we have to predict that. And then um, we also have another definition of the turbulent burning velocity, and that is the total uh, global consumption speed. And this is, this is how uh, we determine um, uh, uh, how much of the reactants that were actually consumed per second. So we, we take the total mass flow of reactants, let's say going up through this tube, in kilograms per second. We divide it by the uh, density of the reactants, divided by the A sub, um, um, well, here in this case, uh, this A sub T is not the same as the other A sub T. This A sub T would be what I've drawn here is the, uh, the smooth curve going through the, the, the flame brush. Um, I just realized that this is a little confusing. But if you take this mass flow divided by rho and A, you get a speed. And that tells you um, the overall uh, consumption speed of, of the reactants. And uh, you can then uh, take the geometry here. Now, if we say this is pretty much a, a cone, and it's not quite a cone, but if we said it was a cone, we could, we could then uh, uh, take the area of a cone 
and we could um, uh, determine the, the angle alpha, which I've drawn, a, I've, I've drawn a straight line through this curved line. And uh, if you take the sine of that angle, it's uh, the opposite over the hypotenuse. So it's uh, d over 2 divided by the hypotenuse, which is this, where h is the, the height of the flame. And uh, then if we take a look at this triangle, uh, the same angle alpha appears, but now we have u0, the, the flow velocity, and s sub t is the component of the flow velocity that's normal to the flame. Okay, so that's the propagation speed. And so we get um, the sine of the alpha is s sub t over u0, so that's the, the opposite over the hypotenuse. And so we come up with this formula, that the turbulent burning velocity is large if and this is all to the minus one half. So if the height is short, burning velocity is large. So if you run an experiment, you measure the height of the flame. Um, this gives you approximately the turbulent burning velocity. And it, it's the overall consumption speed. OK. So. Um, um, that's this quantity right here, S sub t. And um, a long time ago, uh, Dom Kohler and Shelkin um, came up with an idea of how does this wrinkled area depend on the turbulence? Well, we know that there's more turbulence, uh, we'll get more wrinkling. But let's come up with a really simple idea. How do we wrinkle the surface area of the flame? And this is way too simple, but it's an interesting idea. It's in a book by uh, Quo. It's in, also in a book by Lewis and Von Elb. Um, suppose you have an eddy, which is a rotating piece of fluid, and it's moving along at a mean velocity uh, into a flame. And here is a laminar flame that is just sitting there totally flat. But then when this eddy comes into it, it's going to disturb the flow field. So here's the velocity field, uh, let's see, right uh, across this eddy. And there's a, a mean velocity here. And then the, because the eddy's rotating, it's, the top of it's moving to the right. And so there'd be a little bit larger velocity to the right. And down here, the eddy's moving to the left. And so there'd be a lower velocity here. And then the rest of the flow is, is coming at the flame at, a, at some mean velocity. So it's an eddy superimposed on a mean flow coming at a flame. And let's just say the, that it will make the flame pretty much stationary, except that it's wrinkling. In other words, it's, it's centered about this line, but this, this, is, this, this wrinkle is going to occur. Um, now, um, the fact that the flow is a little bit faster here means this angle alpha is going to be uh, not um, 90 degrees, but it's going to be um, some other number. And it's just like the Bunsen flame, just like I just described. Higher velocity means that this wrinkle is uh, more like a cone. And lower velocity means that there's a cone, but it's pointing uh, in the other direction. Because the, the, um, the, the wave is propagating normal to itself, at a fixed speed, S sub L, and the gas is coming at it a little faster up here, and so the, it has to form a little cone. Okay. Now, so it's going to wrinkle into two Bunsen cones, where alpha is still the half angle, just like in the last slide. OK, so now. Um, we say the velocity normal to the wave is S sub L, and the velocity normal to the cone is U2 minus S sub L, so um, times sine alpha. So just like with the Bunsen flame, we do a little bit of geometry. And, um, and so the larger, the, uh, the larger, the stronger this eddy is, the, the, the bigger these cones are going to be, and the more wrinkling they'll be, and the more area they're going to be. Now, if you, if you just assume that these are cones, you, you know the uh, surface area of a cone. The surface area of a cone is uh, given by this formula. Depends on the base of the cone, which is a circle, 
and pi over 4, and then L over 2, if, if the A is a length L, the, the, this little circle here is L over 2 in diameter. And so that's the area of this circle and um, the area of the, the cone that you form is, is this. Uh, the area of the base of the cone is just the area of the circle. So if we take these two and take the ratio, and then we, we use this equation here, it says that the velocity fluctuation is related to h. The bigger the velocity fluctuation, the larger the h. Um, we get rid of um, h, and all we get is the velocity fluctuation. So this is a real simple idea that the amount of wrinkling into cones um, just depends on how fast these eddies are rotating. And this gives a formula that is actually not too bad. But there's a, a constant here which uh, you allow to vary to fit the data. Okay. Now, Dom Kohler came up with another idea. He said, well, you know, this is way too simple. Um, maybe not all turbulent flames are thin flamelets. Maybe they are thickened flamelets. And so he said, what happens if the reaction zone gets and the whole flame gets thick? Well, um, if you look at this formula for the laminar burning velocity, it's equal to the square root of the thermal diffusivity times the reaction rate. So if, if heat can diffuse rapidly upstream in a premixed flame, that will make the flame thicker. And that's where this alpha is. And Dom Kohler argues that um, you have to take the molecular diffusivity, this is thermal diffusivity, add in this turbulent thermal diffusivity, and that says that the heat is going upstream uh, maybe a thousand times faster than in the molecular, in the laminar case. And so, you know, th that would give rise to um, a much larger burning velocity. Okay. And so now we say, well, what is the thermal diffusivity? Well, this uh, parental mixing argument that I gave last time would indicate that this diffusivity is U prime times the integral scale which is uh, centimeters per second times centimeters. And so if you, if you plug that into this, you get, um, um, and you take the ratio of these two, you get a different formula for the turbulent burning velocity. It, it's, it's a little bit like the previous one, but it has this integral scale in it, and it's got a U prime here, which is not squared, so it's a little different, but it does say that um, turbulent flames propagate faster because there's more turbulence and because the integral scales are large. And this is actually a Reynolds number. Now, as it turns out, uh, as, I'll, as I'll discuss uh, um, tomorrow, um, if we look at the data, uh, this formula isn't bad if you go to high Reynolds number, and the other formula is pretty good when you are at low Reynolds number. So, going to keep an open mind. Dom Kohler was probably right on both of these cases, but um, have to figure out when he was right and when he wasn't right. Uh, now, this is a paper that uh, uh, one of my students, uh, or two of my students, uh, submitted to the symposium. Uh, it's similar. To, uh, there's other work done at, uh, in Toronto and other places. But basically, we measured this uh, global consumption speed in a very, very turbulent flame, and we find that it goes up to really large numbers where you can get um, turbulent flames going more than 25 times faster than laminar flames. Okay, this is in a Bunsen-type flame. And we can measure the integral scale, we can measure the turbulence level. However, uh, what we find is that we integrate the flame surface density, remember this is flame area per unit volume, and we integrate it over a volume, and we get um, area. And so this would be the predicted flame propagation speed just based on the fact that it's more wrinkled. And you see that it's way lower than the actual propagation speed. So 
This would be Dom Kohler's first idea, that the flames go faster because they're more wrinkled. And they do go faster, but only up to like a, a four or so times a laminar burning velocity. But then they, uh, they, they stop wrinkling, and they don't get any more wrinkled. The area doesn't change, but they propagate a lot faster. Okay, and so how, why is that? Well, that's because of his second concept, the turbulent diffusivity. The thermal diffusivity must be really going up a lot. Um, and therefore, the turbulence must be getting inside the flame and making it diffuse faster. And um, so we're sort of showing that Dom Kohler was right on both counts, but in different regimes. Um, now, this, is, this, this data I just showed you in the last slide was only for a Bunsen flame, and we cannot say that all flames behave the same way, and that's a problem with turbulent combustion, is that you need to define like six major canonical geometries, okay, and then see if they all agree, and they generally don't, okay. So if you have premixed turbulent flames, like one, two, three, four, five, six flames, you won't get the same formulas and the same graphs like I just showed. But they'll have the same general trends, but they'll have slightly different parameters and everything. The formula is different for each. Um, residence time is important. Okay, um, if, if, if you look at that little uh, example I gave you with the eddy going through the flame, you know, you said that the burning velocity only depends on the turbulence level. Well, that can't be really true all the time because um, um, residence time is important. If you, if you subject a flame to turbulence for a short time or you subject it to turbulence for a really long time, the degree of wrinkling will be different, okay? That's pretty obvious. So the Bunsen flame tip is a lot more wrinkled than at the flame base. Okay, so if you just look at a Bunsen flame, the base is pretty laminar looking and flat, but the tip is all wrinkled. The same way with a spherical flame. Let's say you, you, you're in an automobile engine, you ignite the flame, even with a, even with a whole lot of turbulence, it looks pretty smooth. Then you wait a little bit, gets a bigger, gets more wrinkled, and then after a really long time, it's just sitting in the turbulence. For, for a really long residence time, it's going to get very, very wrinkled. So this tells us that the parameters that we just discussed in those formulas are not enough. We need, and we, do, we still don't understand exactly how to get this residence time into the formulas, but um, Different geometries wrinkle differently, and the um, propagation is different. Um, uh, some people, after the first hour, pointed out that if you change the reactant temperature, um, things could be very different. Um, the role of the integral scale could be different. You know, you, 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 uh, you know I, I told you, if you take a piece of paper and you wrinkle it up into a ball, it gets a lot of surface. Presumably, it would uh, consume a lot of reactants. But a flame is something that has uh, gases moving away from it. You know, the, when the gas goes through a flame, it's a premix flame, it accelerates. And so you can't just take something, you know, that has velocities going away from it and wrinkle it into a tight ball. So there's a limit to how much you can wrinkle any flame. Uh, the viscosity of the gas goes way up with temperature, and so you you know it, you're talking about a very viscous gas, and turbulence may not even uh, exist. It may it may be destroyed by the flame. And um, so the role of the size of the eddies and what the turbulence does is very different and so we still don't know how to um, how to handle all that so you can imagine i guess i'm posing you some 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 questions that you know how, if we were to model this now uh, we've got to get over some of these these hurdles okay um, uh, again some more basic ideas here if we go back to the um, 
Uh, okay, I'm going to switch. Uh, I was saying that the turbulence makes premix flames go faster. Now I'm going to say turbulence causes faster mixing, which is important in non premix flames. Now we know this. Um, there's a nice paper in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics, which I like. Um, suppose you have a fuel coming um, out of a tube going to the right. And uh, it's mixing with air, which is on the outside. And the air might be coming by at a certain velocity, U sub A, a U sub F. When does this fuel mix to stoichiometric uh, proportions? Now, you maybe covered this in a combustion class, or you thought about this. But this, this paper is really simple and nice. It just says, let's draw a cylinder and just say the fuel stays in a cylinder. Now, it doesn't. You know, it, 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 it diverges and goes out, and then it sort of mixes in a complicated pattern. But let's just say it's in a cylinder. Now, uh, there's fuel coming in from this side of the cylinder. And there's a certain mass flow. We know what that is. Now, there's air coming in only through the sides of the cylinder. And um, the more air that comes in, the more this is diluted from pure fuel to a stoichiometric fuel-air mixture. So you know if it's uh, methane, you need to be, um, 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 in terms of mass, you need to be about 95% um, air and 5% fuel. So you've got to bring in a lot of air to get this to stoichiometric. So we're going to ask, what does the length of the cylinder have to be such that enough air comes in that we mix to stoichiometric? And then we're going to say that's the length of the flame, because um, um, you know, the, the flame is going to, it's not really going to be a shape of a cylinder, but uh, once it's mixed to stoichiometric, um, that's the end of the flame, of a, a non premixed flame. OK, uh, so um, what's really happening in this little box here is that uh, turbulence is causing a, a shear layer, and there are eddies that are rotating around in the shear layer. And the amount of air that's crossing normal to this cylinder surface is, is U sub E. And U sub A is the velocity uh, of the air in this direction. And if you think about a shear layer, you can make the argument that U sub E should be related to U sub, U sub E should be related to U sub A and uh, um, U sub F. This should be. I'm sorry, this is U sub E, and this is U sub F. It got mislabeled. Anyway, here's the air velocity, here's the fuel velocity, and here's the U sub E. This should be U sub F. So um, if you just look at what people have done in shear layers, you can even put a constant here, because it isn't they're just sort of a, um, a certain uh, uh, fraction of the fuel velocity minus the air velocity gives you a velocity difference. And then there's a density effect, which there's work done at Caltech and many other schools that show that mixing depends on density difference. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, but you can say that the, the, the entrainment of velocity is related to the velocity difference of the fuel and the velocity ratio of the density. And if you plug that into this equation, this says that the uh, mass per second of fuel divided by the mass per second of air entrained has to equal the stoichiometric uh, fuel-air ratio. Okay. And so this is the uh, rho u times the area of the, of the circle. And this is rho u sub e multiplied by the area of the cylinder curved surface, which is going to be the, the uh, circumference the circumference of the cylinder times the length. OK, so this is, this is kind of a nice little idea, because we end up with a, sort of the right result um, 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 with a few adjustable constants, of course. But um, the length of the, of the flame um, um, becomes this uh, formula. Well, this is the fuel air ratio of stoichiometric. And now, if you say there is zero air, 
So it's, there's no uh, um, forced air. Um, it's not co-flowing. It's just, just ambient, quiet air that's entrained. The, this term drops out. The use of F canceled, and you get the right re re relation. That uh, the length of the flame is independent of either the uh, independent of the fuel velocity, and a turbulent jet flame is known to have, have a length that's independent of the velocity of the fuel. And this is the right density ratio and um, the right dependence on the fuel air ratio. So this gives you the right result. You just have to figure out what this constant should be from experiments. <clears throat> and uh, if you have a very strong co-flow of air, then the eddies at the edge are being driven by the air and not by the fuel. And so they'll actually be rotating in a different direction because there's strong air co-flow. And this formula now changes. Um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, C1 somehow disappeared. There, there should be a C1 here, but let's say it was absorbed into that C, this new C2. Uh, what we're saying now is that if, if we have a strong coaxial air, the more air you put in, the shorter the flame will get. And that's because you're driving stronger eddies at, and getting more entrainment. Okay. So um, these are just some general ideas, and uh, tomorrow we'll use them in in our in our thoughts. Um, I think I should stop. Right? Oh, it's at four o'clock. We take another break. Right? Okay. Why don't we take a break? 15 minute break. Let's see, it's about 4.07, so maybe, uh, well, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we'll meet again. <laughs>